Um, yes, I am delighted uh, that we are here. I want to thank Cecilia Lynch in particular, the Director of International Studies, um, Jay Newman, the Director, the Chair of uh, European Languages and Studies, <clears throat> and the other people who, the other groups that funded this uh, talk today. Uh, this is what I hope will be the first of many collaborations between French and uh, International Studies, uh, inaugurating the new regional focus in the Francophone world. I'm delighted that you're here. Uh, and it is my pleasure and honor to introduce Cam Glover, who comes to us from Barnard College, <coughs> excuse me, where she has been an assistant and then an associate professor of French since 2002, after receiving her PhD from Columbia University. She has quickly become one of the major voices in Haiti scholarship, along with Laurent Dubois, Nick Nesbitt, Martin Monroe. <clears throat> Her work focuses on the relationship between Haiti and the rest of the world, or put more broadly, between the Caribbean and, more narrowly, American and French modernist traditions. Her first book, Haiti Unbound, A Spiralist Challenge to the Postcolonial Canon, which came out at Liverpool University Press in 2010, it examines the singularity of Haiti, the way its history and culture differ from other histories and cultures in the Caribbean. She names Haiti, and I quote, <clears throat> the originary psychosocial space of the black radical tradition in the Caribbean and beyond. This is an essential formulation. Let me read it again. Haiti is, quote, the originary psychosocial space of the black radical tradition. Why originary? because Haiti was the first French colony to revolt against French rule and successfully produce a revolution in 1804. Psychosocial, because Haiti's revolution punctures the dominant narrative of slave abjection and disenfranchisement, confirming the displaced subject's potential to reorder social and political life. In the Caribbean and beyond, because the black radical tradition to which Professor Glover is referring includes not only the Caribbean radical tradition, Marxist and anti-imperialist, but also the African-American and African radical traditions. Haiti is thus figured in Glover's work as simultaneously the Ur case and the exception. What happened in Haiti may have initiated and inspired radical action elsewhere, but Haiti took its own path as it was increasingly isolated from the rest of the world by a series of oppressive regimes and confining occupations. In Haiti Unbound, Professor Glover argues that this very isolation encouraged the development of a literary culture unbound by the Eurocentric traditions adopted and revered in a place like Martinique, for instance. The spiralist authors that she studies, Franck Etienne, Jean-Claude Fignolet, and René Philoctet, approached identities entities and spaces as always changing, moving along a path, a spiral path, that eventually transforms each into its opposite. As a politics, spiralism eliminates or makes impossible the rigid dichotomy between center and periphery, dominant and marginal, since a new point on the temporal or geographical spiral will always provide a new set of coordinates for the viewers of the scene. One could characterize Professor Glover's work as affecting a similar type of displacement, her current book project titled Disorderly Women, The Audacity of the Eye, shifts our point of view from that of the heroic individual male figure whose militancy in Haiti has almost always ended in new instances of power grabbing and corruption to the point of view of the not so heroic female figure, her quote, resolute non-alliance with ideological groups and her gendered distrust of utopian impulses. Articles related to this project have already appeared, Black Radicalism in Haiti and the Dis Disorderly Feminine, the case of Marie Vieux Chauvet in Small Acts in, in 2013, and Confronting the Communal, Maurice Condé's Challenge to the New World Orders in Moi Tituba, published in French form in 2012. She is uh, on the editorial board of the lively pan-Caribbean journal Small Acts and a regular contributor to the New York Times Review of Books. Two works are coming out imminently, a translation of Franck Etienne's first novel, Mur à Crever, 
or ripe to be burst, I don't know how you translate it, and an issue of Yale French Studies on the uh, woman author Marie Vieux Chauvet, who has been neglected um, in studies of Haiti. I am delighted to welcome, and I hope you'll join me to welcome Professor Kayama Glover. Thank you, Carrie. Wow, um, that was a wonderful and very generous introduction. It's, it's great to hear one's own thinking and work filtered through, through someone else and someone so engaged and, and thoughtful. So thank you sincerely for the introduction and thank you for the invitation and thank you all for, for coming out uh, this evening to hear me talk about Haiti, which is, as you might have understood from that introduction, kind of my obsession. Um, but, and even though I try, I was just explaining to Professor Nolan and to um, Victoria, whose last name I, I just, Bernal. Bernal, Professor Bernal, um, that this is, this is work that um, I don't even know where it fits, but it's been um, things that I've been thinking about since the earth, earthquake in 2010, um, about ways in which Haiti is represented in the wider world. And I thought I was moving on from that after my first book and started looking at, at women and difficult women or disorderly women as I've been calling them. Um, and yet I've been feeling compelled to come back to um, framings of Haiti in, in the North Atlantic space and beyond. So the title of my talk tonight, as you can see, Containing Object Objection, Haiti, Gender, and the Humanitarian Gaze. Um, as many of us do, I titled the talk before I had finished writing it. So. Um, it's about that, but it's about other things too, and if there are things in that title that you'd hope to hear about, I can probably talk about them in Q&A afterwards. So um, with that, I'll just I'll go to the paper. So, In the years since the January 2010 earthquake in the Caribbean, Haiti's become something of a superstar, a cause célèbre. And I, like many of us who have long engaged with the nation's history, cultural production, and quotidian realities, I've been somewhat uneasy with the terms of Haiti's presence on the world stage. There is obviously a lot to be uneasy about. The corruption and other failures of humanitarian efforts, the persistent encroachment on Haiti's sovereignty, and the snail's pace of reconstruction, among else, among much else. But uh, this talk tonight isn't actually about any of that, or it is obliquely. But what I'm going to focus on here is a very particular discursive phenomenon that underlies, at least in part, I think, Haiti's botched material recovery from the earthquake. I want to suggest that from the Haitian Republic's revolutionary beginnings to its fraught contemporary reputation, more and less subtle articulations of its people's Africanness have emerged in global popular discourse and tapped into historical North American and European practices of distancing. Though we can argue that there are and have been moments and contexts in which Haiti's Africanness has been lauded or plotted, mostly by Haitians and by <coughs> intellectuals like myself, it's nonetheless this Africanness, it's nonetheless been deployed as frequently, if not to say overwhelmingly, as the most tangible measure of Haiti's problematic singularity with respect to the rest of the American hemisphere. So what I want to talk about this evening are what I'm thinking about as the narratives of exceptionalism, of exceptionalism, excuse me, and more precisely, the language and the imagery of disaster that suggest Haiti's presupposed ontological difference. It's a formula I borrowed um, from Achille Mbembe. And to do this, I'm going to try to weave together some concepts taken from the fields of critical media science and communication studies on the one hand. So this is already a little far afield from what I usually do, which is literature. Um, and then put that together with questions raised by trauma studies and by psychoanalysis on the other. And I want to think about some of the truly uncanny commonalities between images of Haiti and images of sub-Saharan Africa as they're constructed and circulated in Euro-North American media. And in presenting the specific modes of this conflation of Afro-geographies and Afro-cultures, I'm going to offer some reflections on the ways in which deep-seated industrial world anxieties regarding the race and the gendered body and its material needs work to disallow possibilities for true empathy. And so I'm going to say that at play are the uncomfortably bound issues of space, race, pity, and fear. And at the root of all of this, I think, is a concern with proximity and contagion. So those are my key words. There's a lot of them. They'll come up again and again over the course of the talk. So while the idea of Haiti as foundationally African has marked some affirming representations of the embattled island nation, positively inflected constructions of Haiti's African sociocultural foundations are few and far between. More common, or at the very least more strident, 
is the idea of Haiti as stunted by its ties to the dark continent. Haiti is seen as a sort of third world misfit, stubbornly anchored in the space of the white Western Americas. Obviously, this is a perception that's been around since 1804, but right now, and in the period immediately following the January 2010 earthquake in particular, the global news media has seemed to take up this trope of Afro-Haiti with something of a vengeance. Among the more memorable instances of this kind of narrative is, of course, media mogul and televangelist Pat Robertson's now notorious assertion that Haitians long ago entered into a, quote, pact with the devil in order to win their independence. And I'm going to try to play something here. I'm using tech, which is unfamiliar to me and generally doesn't work out, but this, it actually might work. So here we go. Absolutely, Pat. Yeah, that poor woman who had to do that, that interview with him. Um, so yeah, so I don't know how many people had heard about that, that quote, the idea that Haiti had made a pact with the devil to get itself free. Um, but this is something that really went fairly viral. And we laughed a lot about it, but not everybody was laughing. And I'll come back to that. I'll come back to that later. Similarly appalling um, as this, uh, the, this interview with Robertson is New York Times cultural commentator David Brooks's infamous claim that Haiti's persistent degradation up to and including its devastation by the earthquake, that this is a direct consequence of the nation's, quote, progress resistance culture, of which voodoo is the first instance. And in this op-ed piece that David Brooks wrote for the Times in January of 2010, he, he uses language that sounds pretty much just like the offensive nonsense that was spouted by the esteemed Pastor Robinson, Robertson right down to the comparison with the Dominican Republic. And this is what uh, Brooks has to say. This is an, this is an excerpt, but I'm going to read the, the whole paragraph because it's also um, pretty compelling stuff. So Brooks writes, I quote, why is Haiti so poor? Well, it has a history of oppression, slavery, and colonialism, but so does Barbados, and Barbados is doing pretty well. Haiti has endured ruthless dictators, corruption, and foreign invasions, but so has the Dominican Republic, and the DR is in much better shape. Haiti and the Dominican Republic share the same island and the same basic environment, yet the border between the two societies offers one of the starkest contrasts on earth, with trees and progress on one side, and deforestation and poverty and early death on the other. Haiti, like most of the world's poorest nations, suffers from a complex web of progress-resistant cultural influences. There is the influence of the voodoo religion, which spreads the message that life is capricious and planning futile. There are high levels of social mistrust. Responsibility is often not internalized. Child-rearing practices often involve neglect in the early years and harsh retribution when kids hit nine or 10. We're all supposed to politely respect one another's cultures, but some cultures are more progress resistant than others, and a horrible tragedy was just exacerbated by one of them." End quote. So the New York Times published this blame the victim rant on January 14th, two days after the earthquake that killed hundreds of thousands of people just 600 miles off the coast of Florida. And in the rest of this op-ed, Brooks goes on to advocate for what he calls intrusive paternalism which you know, God knows what that is. But the point is, both Robertson and Brooks's degrading mediatizations of Haiti refer to or rely on a casting of Afro-spiritual practices in the North American context in a way that implicitly and explicitly links Haiti's social, political, and economic dis dysfunction to its supposed Afro nature. And they use voodoo, of course, in quotes voodoo, as the medium through which to do this the most expediently. And Brooks in particular does this while extracting Haiti from the wider, presumably more civilized Caribbean. In both cases, a reductive or downright inaccurate historical narrative is paired with this pointed reference to voodoo. The extent to which Haiti and Africa, Haiti as Africa in America's backyard, the extent to which this trope circulates in Euro-North American media as a site of pitiable and consumable otherness, speaks to what a media scholar named um, Mirali Bilagi has described, and I think rightly, as the homogenization of global blackness. And what he means by this is the kind of one-note discourse of Afro-uniformity that we get in the international press, a sort of discourse that successfully promulgated by the consistent enactment of an ever-repeating set of othering claims and policies. You only have to think about the many parallels between the spatial and temporal perceptions of Haitians and Sub-Saharan Africans over the last decades. The Haitian internally displaced persons camps, these are the, the tent cities, the IDP camps that you've all seen in the news. The, the IDP camps, 
and U.S. immigration detention centers here in the Americas are symbolically, ideologically, and, and logistically reminiscent of refugee camps in Kenya, Chad, Congo, and Guinea, to name a few. And these similarities, I think, are telling. Places of containment like these both generate and sustain foundational notions of black and brown separateness, distinction, difference. And it's, it's actually worth noting that, um, the immig that immigration detention in the United States actually began in 1981 under Ronald Reagan as a response to the mass migration of, ha of Haitians who were fleeing the Duvalier <coughs> dictatorship. Um, so he's really at the root of our understanding of how to treat um, refugees or people from other poor, browner spaces. I'd argue that the very fact of the camp as a confined area, an area of demarcated non-belonging, whose borders are guarded by armed forces, emblematizes what is ultimately a criminalization and a militarization of civilian society. All this to say, far from being neutral administrative boundaries, the parameters of the camp are policed by state agencies that serve primarily an exclusive and an excluding first world. The camp represents a geopolitically determined strategy of containment that feeds into pre-existing popular conceptions of non-white peoples as threatening on multiple levels. In the case of Haiti in particular, media portrayals of life in the IDP camps have tended to depict them as barely contained spaces of extreme violence. And I think we need to pay attention to the fact that the violence that's most often discussed since the earthquake, most emphatically mediatized, that is, has been sexual violence. <clears throat> Haiti's, quote, rape epidemic has been placed at the center of international aid discourse, and a clarion call has been sounded to address the atrocities perpetrated against women. And these, this is just a, a kind of a collation of headlines I've been collecting since the earthquake about this, about this rape epidemic. And these are from reputable news sources. You have the New York Times up there, The Guardian, CNN, um, Wired Magazine, the one about um, using tech to document Haiti's rape epidemic. There's an actual Wikipedia page, sexual violence in Haiti. Um, and then all, all of these obviously very sort of sensationalist, um, US disturbed, I mean, okay, by Haiti's rape epidemic, et cetera. And yeah, of course it's undeniable that sexual assault is a horrifying and persistent reality of life in the tent cities. But the problem I see here with headlines like this is that the media portrayals of this quote epidemic have tacitly exceptionalized the phenomenon conveniently eliding the fact of a wider first world denigration of the humanity of women and girls. Disingenuously decontextualizing, these media portrayals fail to situate in any way sexual violence against women as a global reality. I'm talking about the sexual terrorizing of black women in American slave society, the notion of, quote, legitimate rape brought to the fore in US electoral politics not so long ago, and of course, sexual abuse in the Haitian camps and in refugee camps all over the world that involve UN personnel. So all of this is left unspoken, and the reading and the viewing public is left with the ultimately reassuring intimation that the problem of sexual violence against women is limited to poor, foreign, brown spaces, capital O, other spaces. We're led to believe, more importantly, that this violence can be contained. We are enabled in our role as spectators, looking from a distance and at a remove at them. And I use this issue of the so-called rape epidemic as just one example of the many contrived discourses of non-proximity that currently surround Haiti, a sustained Afro-exceptionalizing tendency that relies on and shores up an equally persistent idea of North Atlantic exceptionalism. And not to mention the very obvious fact that the evocative term epidemic plays directly on our fears of contagion, of us catching whatever it is that they've got. And so paired with this discourse of spatial confinement is an equally disturbing, multi-pronged temporal narrative of stasis and ahistoricism. And this is something I talk about a lot in, in my first book. It's this narrative that draws from the well of a presumed Afro-homogeneity and violence. It's a narrative that conceives of Haiti as stuck immutably in a rut of post-revolutionary failure. The perception of the Republic's more than 200-year history as a single repeating story of political corruption, bloody coups, economic collapse, and of course, demands for humanitarian aid. This script implicitly posits an ontological vulnerability to disaster, man-made and environmental, that conveniently and insistently denies the destructive impact of Euro-North American intervention in Haiti's economic and political affairs over the course of the past two centuries. In a set of comments that were made to a live audience of thousands of people, only 11 days after the earthquake, the 
Conservative American pundit Bill O'Reilly made particularly unsettling use of the Haiti as disaster trope. Um, this was during a stop on um, his Bold and Fresh tour. Then that's a real thing. He does this thing called a Bold and Fresh tour, uh, where he travels around the country, being bold and, and fresh, I guess. Um, yeah. And so he, he was he was doing this in 2010, and he made the following off the cuff remarks as part of a broader dig that he was trying to make actually at President Obama. And he says um, he says this to Glenn Beck actually. So we're going for tech again. Let's see. All right, so that's, um, that's Bill O'Reilly with Glenn Beck talking about Obama, but getting, getting a little something in there about Haiti. And his point is pretty clear. And it repeats the remarks made by Brooks and the remarks made by Robertson that, quote, despite the best efforts of generous and patient North American patrons, Haitians remain inexplicably incapable of improving their own conditions. So again, what I'm claiming is that there's a persistent Western denial of complicity in the impoverishment and degradation of Haiti. And what I mean by this are the variety of historical ways in which Haiti and the United States in particular have a common history. I'm talking about the 1825 debt, um, which was imposed on the Haitians under threat of renewed war. Right? Some of you may be familiar with this, the fact that the French obliged their former colony to indemnify them for the property they lost during the re revolution in exchange for re recognizing Haiti's status as a republic. So just to make that very clear, the Haitians, who were the winners of the war, had to pay the French, who were the losers of the war, 150 million francs, which is about 21 billion of today's dollars, um, in order to be recognized as an independent republic. Right? So the Haitians had to fight for, win, and then still buy their freedom from slavery, initiating a cycle of death that persists to this day. Of course, I'm also talking about the 20-year U.S. Marine occupation of Haiti from 1915 to 1934, initiated by Woodrow Wilson, during which time Haiti served as this military bulwark against German imperialism. And I'm talking about the CIA support of the brutal Duvalier dictatorships in the 1970s and 1980s, during which time Haiti served as a military bulwark against Castro's communism. And I'm talking also, of course, about the U.S. support of the military coup that ousted democratically elected Haitian President Jean-Bertrand Aristide in 2004, at which time the U.S. stepped in to protect its manufacturing interests in Haiti. And then I'm also talking about the devastating mass extermination of Haitian pigs in the 1980s and the Clinton-led rice fiasco in the 1990s. And this one's particularly interesting because Clinton has actually publicly apologized um, for initiating <clears throat> the trade policies that destroyed Haitian rice farming. He admits to having made, quote, a devil's bargain. So you can't really make up this kind of irony. Haiti, Haitians made a pact with the devil, but it's the US president who's admitting to the devil's bargain that put Haiti, Haitian rice farmers um, basically out of business. And I'm talking obviously about the current UN occupation of Haiti and the UN introduction of cholera to the island, a disease that had never before been endemic to Haiti. So talk about contagion. The list of grievances is long. But I'm going to leave it here because my point is that the first world has consistently denied its complicity in Haiti's so-called failures, while at the same time indulging a spectacle of uplifting Haiti. And this, I think, absolutely recalls first world, uh, first world behaviors towards sub-Saharan Africa. It's as if Haiti, like Africa, is somehow no historical part of the world, except where for Hegel, Africa's ahistorical nature was conceivable due to its presumed literal, i.e. geographical, non-contact with Europe. Contemporary Haiti has been cast as ahistorical, uninvolved in North Atlantic history, despite its embeddedness at the very heart of the modern American hemisphere. Proximity is almost pathologically disavowed. And this, I think, is the updated version of not being any historical part of the world. It's the same script that allows for the characterization of neo-colonial dictatorship in post-independence Africa as a manifestation of the inherently warlike tribalism of ind indigenous African culture, rather than, of course, as a direct consequence of the tyrannical model of governance, reckless border drawing, and promotion of inter-ethnic conflict that marked European colonization of the region. So be it Haiti or Africa, in both instances, the Afro is made ahistorical via a disavowal of historical relationships that implicate nations of the West. So what I'm arguing is that the marginalization of Haiti through insidious practices of distancing and confinement is crucial to the first world project of holding itself harmless with respect to its role in producing the conditions of degraded existence that are in fact the byproducts of globalized modernity. <laughs>
And I'm also arguing that an extensive aid narrative is a sweet public face of these modi operandi. How do you sell dehumanizing internment and usurpation of sovereignty to ostensibly post-racial, post-colonial first world citizenry? I think you, you focus on bodies. You focus on bodies at the expense of voice. You facilitate narratives of pity that leave ample room for disgust. You tap into foundational first world fears of the inexorable vulnerability of all modern beings to exploitation and the predation of neoliberal world order policies that are our human present. In other words, you counter our first world anxieties at the certain fact of non-difference and the latent contagion of misery by insisting on the difference and maybe even the not quite humanity of those who are the most poor, the most disenfranchised, and the most degraded. And this first world terror, I would say, is addressed not only by the erection of these physical boundaries and borders between self and other, us and them, but also via the circulation of body-based narratives of non-commonality. As a kid, growing up in the, in the bourgeois suburb of New York, White Plains, New York, and Westchester in the 80s and 90s, my knowledge of Africa was fairly limited, conditioned by images of misery. As far as the US media was concerned, 20th century black Africa was famine and flies and outstretched hands. Sorry. Mother nature turned against human beings. Suffering over there in Africa was seemingly endemic and without bottom. But I could do my part to mitigate it, Sally Struthers and other people told me, for the price of a cup of coffee. I don't know if any of you remember these ads where the Christian Children's Fund and Save the Children would generally have a narrator who would come onto the screen and amidst a bunch of very hungry looking, very dirty looking fly covered children and, and tell us um, that we could offer 70 cents and that would be sent to Africa and, and their lives would be better and our parents would tell us to finish our dinner because there were people starving in Africa and things of that nature, right? So in, in well-meaning commercials like the one here, brown children and women stared either pleadingly or ingratiatingly or numbly but always silently into the camera. While we were reminded for just pennies a day, we could make things less bleak for those anonymous and far away, that is, non-proximate bodies. And so it strikes me that very little actually distinguishes the, the mid-80s and mid-90s representations of brown, and especially African, brown and African personhood, from recent depictions of Haitians. At work in both contexts are phenomena of categorization and devaluation that operate in parallel with humanitarianism. In both contexts, it's suggested that Afro-being is at once essentially prone to and built for suffering. In this long post-earthquake moment in particular, overtly bigoted contentions like those of Robertson, Brooks, and many, many others are buttressed by a widely circulated and graphic visual narrative of Haitian bodily and environmental abjection. Listless mothers cradling fly-covered children, dusty half-clothed men and women bleeding, screaming, sweating in IDP camps undifferentiated hordes of sufferers fixed at once in and out of time and space. And I'd say that these internationally circulating visual representations of a dystopian Haiti, as with journalistic constructions of sub-Saharan Africa, are reassuring. They reassure by the completeness of their subject's abasement. And in this, they affirm the boundaries of global citizenship. At issue, then, is the establishment and the maintenance of borders. And these borders, I think, are even more important than the ones that are marked on military maps. So leaning on, um, on Christopher a bit here, I want to think about these borders as collective, emotional, and psychosocial fantasies that are in fact meant to allay first world anxieties regarding an imminent becoming abject. Becoming abject ourselves via radical decapitalization, right? This great fear that we have since at least 2008, the looming financial crisis. Becoming abject via disease, via terrorism, via environmental self-destruction and climate change. The sustained visual narrative of imperiled non-belonging is, to my mind, a dedicated work of establishing radical difference and disallowing identification with the third world. The ricketiness of the fence that separates the nervous haves from the hungry have-nots explains in large measure, I think, the media saturation with images of Afro-abjection. In order to counter the ambiguity of difference we wish were absolute but isn't, we mobilize pity rather than empathy. Now, one of the most effective modern ways in which the pathetic pitiability, the abjection of the Afro-other has been constructed and circulated is via the telethon, a highly effective humanitarian fundraising tool. The telethon uses entertainment to solicit charity on a massive scale. 
its charitable targets are, for the most part, either the first world ill or the third world brown and poor. It's a media phenomenon that, in the case of disaster relief, brings the first and the third world into a space of temporary and hierarchized false intimacy. Intimacy in which the categories of human being are demarcated for all the world to see. In the summer of 1985, a 16-hour dual venue concert called Live Aid was broadcast to raise funds for victims of the famine in Ethiopia, the famine that lasted from about 1983 to 1986. And the concert logo, which you see here, features a stylized representation of the African continent as a guitar. And in the bottom right corner, you'll see there's um, a naked black child who stands there back to the camera. Um, and I don't know if you can make it out from the image here, but it's, you can, the ribs of the child are, are visible. And that photo is actually an attenuated iteration of what was then the more wi widely distributed images of Ethiopian children, right? That skeletal, big-eyed, hair red from malnutrition, ludicrous distended bellies. This Live Aid concert closed with what became the fastest selling American pop single in history, We Are the World. I don't know if any of you have heard of it. People still play it. It's a very, very catchy song. Um, it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of like that other song, There Won't Be Snow in Africa This Christmas Time. I don't know, another catchy, absurd song. But in any event, um, so We Are the World was reported, was recorded uh, in 85 by the supergroup USA for Africa. And with a beautifully clever pun, USA actually stands for um, United Supportive Artists for Africa, but obviously we know who the money was um, in that endeavor. But a quarter of, a, what's interesting to me is that a quarter of a century later, so 25, literally 25 years later in 2010, a remake of this song was released by a new supergroup, Artists for Haiti, on February 12th, during the opening ceremony of the 2010 Winter Olympics. And though it was recorded after the official Haiti Relief Telethon, Hope for Haiti Now, Global Benefit for Earthquake Relief, the song's lyrics and its accompanying video participate in the construction of a similar narrative of hierarchized intimacy, one that very much aligns with humanitarian representations of sub-Saharan Africans 25 years ago and since. And of course, while these telethons are well-intentioned and unquestionably expedient in generating massive aid resources, what these celebrity-studied high-production value media packages ultimately vehicle are silent black bodies in need. The hyper-vocality of giver-pityers and the relative mutism of abject receivers is crucial to the preservation of the political and social divide between Euro-North American and Afro-humanity. And as the final words of We Are the World 25 for Haiti declare, and it's Will I Am who actually sings them, quote, we can't let them suffer, we cannot turn away. Like Katrina, Africa, Indonesia, and now Haiti, they need us, they need us, they need us, they need us. And it fades out with this, they need us, they need us. So Katrina, a natural disaster, Africa, a continent, Indonesia, okay, and now Haiti. Um, they need us, they need us, they need us. But as important, I think, and maybe even most important, is what we need. If bodies are what we see, what is it that we get? And I'd argue that what we get is relief. We get relief. The few, thank God that's not me and my kids, kind of relief. The telethon spectacularly cements oppositions that, in the end, provide a powerful measure of security. In Hope for Haiti Now and the Live Aid Telethon, the beings that flashed across television screens in Europe and the United States were, for the most part, little other than their body's needs. And the singular adamance of their bodies, the visibility of their hunger and their suffering and their wounds, tacitly affirmed our self-preservationist secret belief, perhaps, in their lesser humanity. They're being built for suffering. Because the fact of the matter is, insofar as Enlightenment paradigms pervade our contemporary understandings of the human, the physical body is a testament to limitation, in counterdistinction to the limitlessness of the mind. The body is to be shunned, devalued. Hunger, poverty, and materiality are posited in opposition to intellect, reason, and political legitimacy. The helped are overwhelmingly brown, the helpers are not. And there's no question but that humanitarian telethons <coughs> contribute meaningfully to the separating out of the Afro world from the rest of the human. What Guillermina de Ferrari has very eloquently described as, quote, the dissymmetry by which one has a body and the other is a body. Telethons reinforce this segrega segregation, and I think they do so with some intentionality. And at the risk of sounding like a conspiracy theorist, I will explain what I mean by that. So while aid for Ethiopia, Haiti, and Katrina was solicited against a backdrop of suffering bodies, 
The 9-11 Telethon, America, a Tribute to Heroes, was the title. It was a reserved and a poignant affair. It was put together by Hollywood producer Joel Gallen, and he's the same man who produced Hope for Haiti Now. So this to say that there was a choice made in terms of the aesthetics of the two telethons. So on our screens for A Tribute to Heroes, a dark room lit only by hundreds of candles where performers sang and other celebrities delivered brief messages. And that was it. No bodies, no drama, no sensationalism. Singers, candles, dark room. And beyond this event, one would really be hard pressed to find in the wider media any of the explicitness that so marks the disaster porn generated in the wake of third world catastrophe. What you're more likely to find is footage of candlelight prayer vigils, flowers deposited at makeshift graves, flyers with individual faces, individuals smiling, holding beloved pets, arms wrapped around friends or family, full of life. No American bodies are subjected to the indignity of abjected display. So Fanon had it actually very much right. The Manichaean spatial division of human beings is premised absolutely on a moral partitioning of human being. In this instance, those who suffer and those who save. So what's my point? It's all well and good for me to stand up here and in characteristic academic fashion, look with critical cynicism at human efforts to effect positive change. After all, given that misery and violence and poverty remain as facts in the modern world, and given that to not acknowledge them and not work toward their alleviation isn't an option, what exactly are we meant to do? Obviously, I don't know. I don't, I'm not sure in any, I'm not sure. But it seems to me that perhaps one place to start, at least for those of us like me who make our living engaged primarily with literary artifacts, one option would be to attend to what I've come to think about as narratives of individuation. Right, so this notion of the individual being central. Narratives that avoid cliches of the poor and the non-white as superhumanly resilient or subhumanly abject. Those exceptionalizing trap tropes that ultimately deny proximity as effectively as the various forms of bigotry we commonly denounce. And part and parcel with a particular attentiveness to stories offered by self-telling individuals is, I think, and maybe unfortunately, a need to look closely at and to take seriously, in fact, some of those stories that flatten and dehumanize. And I really hesitated when I put together this presentation. I was, very, I was torn about including some of these clips and highlighting the comments by Robertson and Brooks and Riley. I was worried about giving them this space. But it so happened that while I was writing this talk and thinking about these things, I was also teaching uh, Aimé Césaire's discourse on colonialism uh, to my undergraduates. And as you all, are, or many of you, I would imagine, are aware, Césaire makes extensive use of this sort of hoist them by their own petard strategy, right? So he includes so much of the language of the most virulent racists or people who didn't think of themselves as racists at the time, he uses their words to sort of let them dig their own graves. And I'm totally not claiming anywhere near the brilliance of Césaire, but I'm just suggesting that he kind of lent me the space to start thinking about what it means to let voices that get to matter actually speak their own lunacy. Um, in their original context. There's some value to looking closely at influential and troubling voices that end up being important in contemporary society and sort of filtering into our consciousness. So I'm still obviously uncomfortable, but I also feel like only the voices themselves in their original powerful spaces, national television, YouTube, The New York Times, CNN, The Guardian, only in their original powerful spaces can they show us the extent of what we're dealing with. So I'm arguing that we must really consider and try to understand the degrading stories about Haiti and other, other spaces and the so-called third world that have seeped into our popular consciousness, whether we like it or not. We can't afford to dismiss them as so much right-wing ridiculousness, however tempting that may be, however laughable they may seem. Because as Nigerian, Nigerian writer Chimamanda Ngozi Ndiche has so eloquently put it in a recent TED Talk, which I encourage you all to have a look at, she says we mustn't underestimate, quote, how impressionable and vulnerable we are in the face of a story, end quote. And so I'd say we really must recognize the extent to which the stories we hear can undermine possibilities for empathy, for seeing beyond alterity, and for recognizing proximity, for taking off the spectacles that distort our humanitarian gaze. Thank you.
are better than I, but from what I do know, um, well, as you probably have heard, Haiti has also been given this, this label, the Republic of NGOs, and, and the reason I say that is just to suggest that there's a difference in, there's no sort of one global narrative of behavior that's happening on the ground. Um, so I'm going to try to be nice. Um, there is definitely a similar understanding in some NGO circles that Haitians brought this on themselves by their ignorance and by their political and economic failures, right? And this is the narrative that undergirds, in particular, in particular, a lot of the NGO work that's being done by Protestant evangelical groups. Start. So, and this is a whole other line of discussion one could have, but there are many <coughs> different NGOs who have assigned them granted themselves responsibility for different tent cities. And if you are in a tent city, for example, that's run by a Christian evangelical organization, there are certain obligations on the part of those who are part of the tent, i.e. no practicing of voodoo, right? Conversion, attendance at church services. So there's a sort of string of attached mentality that is buttressed by this understanding that it's for your own good, right? Um, there's also the problem of the NGOs not listening to patients in their determinations about what policies and practices should be enacted. Right? So this discounting of um, solutions that patients might have about ways to deploy the funds that have been generated by the Red Cross and other international aid organizations about how they actually want the money spent. Um, and there's a brilliant film that I encourage you all to see that came out last year. It was free online for a while, but I don't know that it still is. In 2000, uh, not last year, two years ago, 2012, Raoul Pet's Assistance Mortelle, which is subtitled in English, I believe, the, the English title is Fatal Assistance. And I bring that up because he really gets to this question of the silencing of the voices of Haitians by international aid organizations because of this idea that they're incapable of self government. Um, that completely extracts the idea that the Asian government has not been able, has not, not been able, has not been permitted to function independently of intervention from the United States and Canada and Europe uh, since the 19th century. Right? Um, and there's a particularly poignant scene in that film where um, Preval, who was the acting president over during the time of the, of the earthquake and the following, sitting in a room with heads of state and NGO workers around a big table. And he's sitting at the head of the table, drinking a Coke, and everyone is talking all around him. He doesn't say one word in the course of the meeting. And he just gets up from the table and walks out, and the, the documentary follows him. He gets up and he walks out into the hall and he's just shaking his head. He's not being the president of the republic. He's not been consulted, he's not been engaged. And I'd say that you know, that too comes from this narrative of, yeah, of, of incapacity to be sovereign. Not a coincidence. I mean, the UN is there, and it's not a nation, but it's the United Nations, and it's not a union. It's not the unity of all the nations. Right? It behaves very much as an imperial entity um, in countries that have been denied their sovereignty. And it is definitely in that position right now. And uh, I should also say, this is not to hold nations blameless at all either. Right? This is a very specific intervention I'm making, and I'm looking at a narrative that I'm identifying. But this is not to discount the real failures and the, con and the continued failures of the Haitian state with respect to the Haitian nation. But yeah, just you know, to be clear, I'm not blind to that idea. Hi, thank you very much for your talk. I'm wondering if you would make a difference between the humanitarian aid that is uh, applied to the elite versus other uh, faces, places, uh, cultures, or is what is Your first question about uh, is there something specific about Haiti, and then I, I don't, this isn't, I did use that, I wasn't um, just using that as a disclaimer when I said this is a side project. This is something that I've just started doing, and I am looking into these, um, in sort of this comparative humanitarianism in a sense. Um, but I can say, I guess, a couple of things that aren't wrong um, about that. So, yes, there is a difference, and I tried to get to that in, in the talk a bit. Um, voodoo is something that is never detached from the images of Haiti and its so-called dysfunction and failure. Um, 
the very fact that David Brooks could say something like that about progress resistant culture and use voodoo as the first instance of that in the New York Times um, and feel comfortable doing that it, it, it attests to, to that, that pairing of Katie with sort of barbaric spiritual practice um, that I think very much influences the way that humanitarian aid workers come into the country. So that's one thing. The second thing I think that, that's distinct about Haiti is this dialectic or this tension of proximity and difference. And that's why I've, I've been thinking about it is as Africa and America's backyard because it is so very close to us um, geographically, but also in terms of there are Haitians all over the United States and in, in, in communities throughout the Americas. So there's this weird practice of at once being afraid of the closeness of Haitians um, and then also insisting on their difference slash distance. Um, and I think that Haiti's proximity, the fact that it is across the aisle, across the border with the GR, um, the fact that it is so proximate to Florida, that it makes us think about the way we receive Cubans versus Haitians and this comes into media all the time. Haiti's proximity, I think, makes it a particularly fraught space um, for humanitarian aid and for the discourse that surrounds humanitarian aid. Um, and the second question about tracing the emergence. So this is something I just started to do. I am editing a volume for Liverpool University Press right now. The title of it is, um, a long title, The Haiti Exception, Anthropology and the Predicaments of Narrative. And it's an edited volume, so there's a lot of different people contributing. Um, but the premise of it is that this is nothing new, the way that Haiti is being exceptionalized since 2010. And that, in fact, this is a phenomenon that began, began I mean, obviously, since the 19th century, but specifically in 1941. Right? I won't get into many of the details, but the first United Nations project of humanitarian development in which anthropologists were deployed to establish what the, the practices of humanitarianism would be was an experiment conducted in Haiti in 1941. So Haiti really is at the crux of the ways that we think about who needs help and how we help them. Um, and yeah, yeah. So, uh, that's the most I can say for now, but I'm still working. Um, how does or does language play a role in the um, EU relations between the European and the American realm, like the American realm? How does language? Are you speaking about titles in particular? The language is a tough thing in, in, in Haiti right now, and it's really hard to be a literature scholar of Haiti because the fact of the matter is, um, so the, there are two official languages in Haiti, French and Haida. And but French is actually spoken by about 10%, 10, spoken and read by only about 10, and that's generous, about 10% of the population. The rest of the population is really only fluent, that's not to say literate, but fluent in Creole. And the other really dominant language is in fact English. Um, so, and for obvious reasons, right? Haitians, they're not migrating to France, they're, mi they're migrating to, to Florida and to the United States and to New York. Um, and some to Montreal, but for the most part, the major part of the diaspora is in, in the US. So, the thing, of, the, the thing about language in Haiti, so there is this, this weird three-fold existence of, of these two major languages and then the supposed minor language. Um, but the problem is that Creole is not an indigenously written language, right? So while it is by no, by, it is clearly the most important language in Haiti, um, it doesn't have purchase outside of the islands in ways that it politically empower it, let's say. Um, and so, you know, part of the opacity for Haitians in terms of the NGO workers coming in is a little too critical, right? And I, there's a really great scholar, read her book, uh, Valerie Cowson, um, Migrant Revolutions, who, um, in a talk that she gave, was, was talking about how students of hers, knowing that she was a Haitianist, were saying, okay, after your thing, what can we do? When should we go? How can we help? And she said to them, you know, two things. Um, are you doctors? <laughs> um, and you speak Creole. If you can't answer yes to at least one of those two questions, then the best thing you can do is not go there and drink water that other people need, right? Um, but that being the truth of the matter, um, that, that there is a sort of 
North American do good desire, and it's legitimate and helpful in many ways, um, but that that doesn't take into account who, what, how Haiti is, and language is a huge part of that. But now that a lot of universities are offering wonderful, immersive, Creole language courses, MIT, FS, uh, Florida State University, Duke University, um, et cetera. Um, 
come on, the do read, the do breaker, for example, or uh, which, was fic which is fiction, um, and it's a series of novellas that come together to tell one, basically one story about, about the dictatorship in Haiti. But even her amazing memoir, Oh Brother, I'm Dying, which is the story of her uncle's, you know, one could say murder, but we'll just call it accidental death in a um, immigration detention center in Florida when he was escaping um, from Haiti. Um, and couldn't, they wouldn't give him his medication because he was facing illness. Um, so, she, so she wrote a memoir about her family and about, and about that incident. So Dan Picard, Chauvet, Rouma, um, yeah, just start. Thank you. 